Greetings, and welcome to this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Laches. The better part of valor is discretion. So says Falstaff in Shakespeare's King Henry IV, Part I. Would you agree with him? What is valor or courage? What part does discretion or prudence play in it? These questions lie at the heart of Plato's Laches. But before diving into the center, let's first consider the surface of this dialogue. The Laches falls neatly into two halves. The first half is a discussion of education. The second half is a dialogue about courage. In the first half, an old aristocratic father, Lysimachus, asks two generals, Nicias and Laches, to advise him about whether his teenage son and the teenage son of his housemate should study the newfangled practice of, quote, fighting in arms. Laches recommends that Lysimachus include Socrates, who's standing nearby, in the discussion. Things don't go the way old Lysimachus expected. His would-be experts, Nicias and Laches, disagree with each other about whether the new learning is worthwhile. Socrates then gets the group to agree that the real question is not whether the boys should study fighting in arms, but instead what learning or practice will improve the young men's souls. Socrates also wins their agreement that they should demand that any would-be teachers prove their expertise. Now, to begin this process, Socrates suggests that he asks the two generals about virtue, that is, the excellence of the soul, and specifically that he asks them about the part of virtue which is closest to fighting in arms, namely courage. It is thus halfway through the entire dialogue that the question, what is courage, arises. This second half falls itself into two parts. In the first part, Socrates questions Laches. Now, Laches says that he knows what courage is. It's fighting in the ranks and not running away. By the way, earlier in the dialogue, Laches tells us an important story about how he and Socrates, while serving in Athens' army, had to flee from battle. Socrates kept his head. Laches did not. In other words, Laches thinks that courage is a sort of endurance. He further asserts that it's a very noble endurance, marked by prudence or intelligence. However, when Socrates presses him on this point, Laches retreats. He calls more courageous the people who run risks without safeguarding themselves. Indeed, in his view, the greater the ignorance, the greater the courage. Laches thus contradicts himself. So, in the second part of the second half of the dialogue, Socrates enlists Laches' rival, Nicias. Now, Nicias also believes that he knows what courage is. In fact, he says that he's heard many times from Socrates that virtue is knowledge, and so courage, as a part of virtue, is also a sort of knowledge. The knowledge of terrible and emboldening things, he says. Now, Laches finds Nicias' stance ridiculous. Does he mean that courageous people are prophets who know what things will turn out better or worse? Socrates presses Nicias too. Nicias ends up admitting that he thinks that courage is knowledge of what's good simply, and how to secure that good even from the gods. So Nicias' courage looks like it encompasses justice, moderation, and piety. It looks like the whole of virtue. Nicias thus contradicts himself in his own, his own earlier stance, that courage is a part of virtue. So the dialogue ends with Socrates advising Lysimachus, the father, that they, the old men, should first seek the best teacher for themselves before trying to educate the boys. Lysimachus agrees to take the matter up with Socrates tomorrow. Now there are several puzzling and ironic features of the Laches. I want to focus on three. The most obvious irony is that in this dialogue on courage, the official experts end up with egg on their faces. They don't know what they're talking about. One of them seems to believe that courage is mindless endurance, the other that it is a sort of science. Now even though the dialogue ends without an answer, it is tempting to conclude that the correct view of courage is that it's a mix. It's somewhere between guts, which you're either born with or you aren't, and knowledge about what's worth fighting for, which you must learn or figure out for yourself. But then might not courage as a noble virtue run the risk of dissolving between the two halves of this mixture? 
The second irony is that Socrates, who at the end of his life is found guilty by the fathers of Athens of corrupting the young, here converses with the fathers about the education of their sons and ends up convincing them that they, the fathers, need education. So does the dialogue refute the charge that Socrates corrupted the young, or does it show that he corrupted the old too? Then there is this third oddity. The question, what is courage, does not arise until the middle of the dialogue. What are we to make, then, of the entire first half, the discussion of education? The first half appears to clarify the goal which the second half serves. That is, the dialogue about courage is meant to reveal what someone needs in order to know how to improve the soul. So that dialogue seems to end inconclusively. But earlier in the conversation, Socrates offers a telling analogy to explain this point about ends and means. He gives the example of eyes. If you're trying to help someone see better, the goal is sight, not just this or that eye medication. He then offers a second example of bridling a horse. The real question, he says, is the readiness of the horse, not which bridle to use. So we should ask ourselves which example applies more to this inquiry. Is virtue more akin to vision, or is it a bridle? Now to a general, courage might look very much like a bridle. It's very useful for keeping soldiers in their ranks. But what if virtue is more like vision? Then it may be precisely dialogues of this sort that can help clear away obstacles to our soul vision, namely the partially true, partially mistaken opinions that we all hold and that we learn precisely from our parents. In this respect, Socrates' efforts may have limited effects on the old men, but he might have had quite a powerful effect on their two sons, who sit listening the entire time. Thank you for joining this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Laches.